Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. At least today, I'll have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Uh, this evening, I'll take part in the ITV leaders' debate, which, of course, Theresa May is ducking. <laughs> Ruth Davidson. Presenting officer, we don't have enough teachers in Scotland. And given the fact that all sides accept this, does the First Minister agree with me that when young people here do choose teaching as a career, we should do everything we can to ensure that they stay? First Minister. Well, as we've discussed in this chamber before, Scotland, in common with many other countries, faces a challenge in teacher recruitment. Um, that is why we are increasing the intake into initial teacher education. It's why the General Teaching Council is looking to encourage more people into teaching um, and look at different routes into teaching. I suspect uh, Ruth Davidson is going to ask me next about Teach First. Uh, I've said before I am open-minded to looking at ideas about how we get more young people into teaching, but we've got to make sure that these ideas work for Scottish education. So we'll continue uh, to do everything we can to make sure we address the challenges we face. Ms Davidson. The First Minister raises the issue of Teach First, and let's have a little look at it, shall we? This week we learn that in the last five years, nearly 400 talented graduates have left Scotland to teach elsewhere in the UK. And that's because they were attracted by the Teach First programme, a very successful programme, which despite versions operating in 40 countries around the world, still hasn't been allowed to set foot in Scotland. So that's 400 enthusiastic young teachers who could be in our schools right now, but who aren't because Nicola Sturgeon says so. Yeah. Now, we've heard in recent days about the huge quality issues surrounding teacher training here. So given that, can the First Minister give me a single good reason why she's stopping new schemes like Teach First from running here in Scotland and seeing if they can improve matters? First Minister. Well, I've actually met with Teach First and we have, uh, I have discussed with them previously uh, whether it would be possible to adapt their schemes to fit with Scottish education. We have a principle in Scottish education that people teaching in our school should have a teaching qualification and I think that is a right one. When I uh, visited not long after I became First Minister, a school in London that had taken part in the London Challenge. And of course, we did look carefully at the London Challenge and incorporated some of its learning into our own attainment challenge. But the head teacher I spoke to in that school uh, herself was quite skeptical about Teach First. One of the things uh, she said uh, about it at the time that it was, in her view, and I absolutely appreciate there will be other views about this, that it was quite short term um, and there was a difficulty often in retaining those teachers. So we will continue to discuss with the GTCS, uh, with the teaching profession uh, and with local authorities how we make sure we get the brightest and best teachers into our schools. And indeed, the GTC has already been looking at different ways of bringing young people into schools. And of course, uh, Ruth Davidson doesn't talk about all of the fantastic graduates in Scotland who do go into teaching in Scotland and I certainly want to encourage uh, more of them to do so. Uh, so we'll continue uh, to look at all of these issues as we drive forward with our determination to drive up standards in our schools and close the attainment gap between the richest and the poorest. Ruth Davison. So in answer to give me a good reason why she won't allow Teach First to operate here, we've got, I spoke to a woman in London, but I'm not entirely closing my mind to it. Which is odd, because that is exactly the answer the First Minister gave me on January the 14th in 2016, the last time I asked her about it, almost 18 months ago. Is a, a decision anywhere in our future here? This is a scheme that operates successfully in 40 countries, but not here. And I have to say, you really have to question whether the First Minister really understands the problems that we face, because we have 4,000 fewer teachers than when she came to power. Yeah. And we aren't recruiting nearly enough trainees to fill the gaps. We have 16% of training places for English unfilled and more than a quarter of the training places for maths unfilled. And she claims that her government is on top of this. So let me ask her this, if she is on top of it. What percentage of secondary schools say that a lack of teachers is constraining the number of subjects they can offer? First Minister. Well, I've been very clear about the challenges we face in common with other challenges around teacher recruitment. That's why John Swinney has been working with the GDC to look at how we get more teachers into education. Uh, but it is also why we have been increasing the intake into initial teacher education, considerably increasing 
that intake. Um, as I said in relation to TEACH, first we have uh, had uh, initial discussions uh, about whether that programme can be adapted uh, for the particular circumstances of education. So we'll continue to look at these issues in the round and we will continue to drive forward the plans that we are taking forward. Uh, the National Improvement Framework, which is all uh, ready seeing reforms around school education, the attainment challenge, uh, the attainment fund, uh, the people equity fund in particular, which as we speak is channeling resources into the hands of head teachers so that they can drive the improvements they want to see in their schools. Uh, so while week after week, uh, Ruth Davison quite legitimately gets up and asks questions about this, this government will go on with taking the action that finds the solutions. Ruth Davison. What a lot of waffle. Yeah. I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased the First Minister thinks it's legitimate for me to ask questions about our failing education system. Frankly, I think it's my duty to ask these questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the question that I asked her, the question that I asked her was what proportion of our schools are constrained in the subjects they can offer their pupils because of teacher shortages? And the answer is 70%. That was the figure reported to this Parliament's Education Committee. 70% of schools who can't offer their S4 pupils the subjects they want to because her government has not recruited the teachers. And instead of facing this crisis, what do we get? This week we've seen backslapping of 10 years in power while education has been getting worse. And the reality is, this is a First Minister who has presided over a teacher recruitment crisis who has fallen asleep at the wheel on education, whose response to bad test results is let's just take Scotland out of the tests, and who knocks back good ideas like Teach First for reasons that even she can't explain apart from some woman in London told me to call canny. Well, we have all had enough. Isn't it time that we had a First Minister in charge who doesn't just admit the occasional mistake, but actually does something about all of them? First Minister. You know, the International Summit of Teaching Experts that the Deputy First Minister attended, I think just before uh, Easter, recognised there were teacher recruitment challenges right across the world, including in England. For Ruth Davidson to suggest that somehow this is a problem unique to Scotland, uh, I think is unfortunate. But I also think it's unfortunate that she, week after week, stands up here and rightly um, points to areas where we need to improve, but repeatedly fails uh, to talk about the improvements we are seeing in Scottish education. The fact that in our schools right now, our young people are coming out with record higher passes, record advanced higher passes. We have more young people now achieving National 5 qualifications. We have got record numbers of young people going into positive destinations. If they don't go into higher or further education, they're going into training or work. And we are starting to see on a number of indicators the beginning of the closing of the gap between the richest and the poorest. So I am the first to admit there is much more to do, but Ruth Davidson should stop doing a disservice to teachers and to pupils across this country by using, by using terms like a failing education system. We do not have a failing education system in Scotland, and Ruth Davidson should be ashamed standing up here suggesting we do. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Engagement to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Yesterday, the First Minister and I met with Brendan Cox, the husband of Joe Cox. And at that meeting, the First Minister rightly agreed that there is no place for abuse of any kind in our political debate. A few weeks ago, a prominent internet blogger said of Oliver Mundell, a member of this parliament, that he is the sort of public speaker that makes you wish his dad had embraced his homosexuality sooner. Does the First Minister agree with me that there is absolutely no place in society for homophobia like this? First Minister. Uh, yes, of course. Of course I do. And, you know, for Kezia Dugdale to get up here, um, and I'm being serious about this, and suggest that in any way, shape or form, I would condone homophobia. Um, I, I think is, is deeply unfortunate. I think on these issues, and it was indeed the kind of issue we were all discussing with Brendan Cox yesterday, all of us should make very clear that that kind of uh, language, 
uh, any form of abuse of any minority or indeed of any politician uh, of that nature is completely unacceptable. I see abuse on a daily basis being hurled at me, at my colleagues, at people uh, on my side of uh, the political spectrum. Um, and I don't hold Kezia Dugdale personally responsible for that. So we should all join together and say that that kind of abuse is unacceptable uh, and at least have this as an issue on which we have consensus uh, and not division. Kezia Dugdale. I very much welcome that response for the First Minister. And of course, this was a remark posted on Twitter by Stuart Campbell, who writes for the website Wings Over Scotland. In the Daily Record, I called out Mr Campbell for his homophobic comment. People should listen to this if they're serious about tackling homophobia and abuse in all of its forms. Mr Campbell has written to me via his lawyer to demand a £10,000 payment for, and I quote, damage to reputation. <laughs> Presiding officer, I stand firmly by my comment. I've never kowtowed to a bully and I will not start today. There is a catalogue of evidence that demonstrates the bile which Stuart Campbell appears to believe is acceptable. So given we are in a general election campaign, will the First Minister today condemn Wings Over Scotland and anyone else who poisons the political debate in our country? First Minister. I just have condemned anybody who indulges in that kind of language or that kind of abuse. I am not responsible for Stuart Campbell any more than Kezia Dugdale is responsible for people who hurl abuse at me in the name of being a supporter of the Labour Party. But you know what, presiding officer, let's cut to the chase about what is going on here. Kezia Dugdale is asking me about this today because she hopes it means I won't be able to remind her that her colleagues in Aberdeen yesterday voted for a Tory administration there. So I think what we're seeing here today is a bit of a political smokescreen. So let me, let me put it beyond any doubt. I condemn anybody who hurls abuse on social media or anywhere else, and all of us should do that. The abuse I see directed at me on a daily basis would make somebody's hair curl. And some of it does come from people professing to be supporters of Kezia Dugdale's party. I do not hold her personally responsible for that. I think we should all accept that there are people out there who will do that and we should all unite in condemning it. Kezia Dugdale. Then, officer, when my colleagues do something I disagree with, I take action. Yeah. I'm asking the First Minister to do the same. Just wait. The, wait, she might want to wait a wee second. The comment from Wings Over Scotland was published by an individual who not only distorts our political debate, but regularly spouts hatred. Yet SNP politicians continue to positively engage with him and alert their yes. followers to yes. his beliefs. Yes. There are a few SNP politicians who have called him out, but 44% of SNP MSPs and 50% of SNP MPs have actively encouraged him along. Yeah. I have the list here, and it includes 10 government ministers, the finance secretary, the justice secretary, and the transport minister. Social media can be a force for good, but as leaders we have a duty to stand up when it becomes an outlet for aggression, intolerance and hatred. So I want to ask the First Minister a clear yes or no question. Will she today order her politicians and her own ministers to denounce and shun Wings Over Scotland once and for all? First Minister. I follow thousands of people uh, on Twitter and I am followed by hundreds of thousands of people on Twitter. Is Kezia Dugdale uh, really trying to say, if I was to go through Kezia Dugdale's tweets or the tweets of members of her group or members of her party and I came up with retweets that were somehow unsavoury in some way, is she really saying that she would hold herself 
personally responsible for that. This is absolutely ridiculous line of questioning, <laughs> presiding officer. I unequivocally condemn abuse of any kind. I've got a list here uh, of uh, abuse that's been hurled by me by many people who are now Tory councillors uh, in Scotland. I've had abuse from people who have been members of the Labour Party. I've been called a fascist and a Nazi, uh, or my party has, by Ian Smart, uh, who was a senior member of the Labour Party, and I didn't hold Kezia Dugdale responsible. Let's cut to the chase here. This is a smokescreen being erected by Kezia Dugdale today. Because her party, her party is in disarray, it is in civil war, it is in meltdown, and as leader of the party, she's directing at this at me to hide one simple fact. As leader of the Scottish Labour Party, she is not in control of her own party because she can't stop her councillors going into coalition with Tories up and down the country. That's why she's asking about this today as a smokescreen to protect herself against the state of her own party. Some constituency questions. The first one from Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I wonder if the First Minister would join me in welcoming the Government's appeal victory against the judicial review judgment which blocked the development of offshore wind farms in the Firth of Forth and the Firth of Tay, a victory that's good news for Scotland on the climate change, green energy and jobs fronts. And would you also join me in encouraging the RSPB, who instigated the original action, to accept the appeal decision and resolve their concerns over seabirds by working with the developers on, for example, the sympathetic sighting of turbines? First Minister. Well, firstly, I do very much welcome the judgment. I think the development of offshore wind is important, not just for environmental uh, reasons, but also for economic development reasons in Scotland. And I hope this now means that these developments can continue. Um, obviously, uh, what happens now is a, a decision for the RSPB. I certainly hope we will see uh, an end to the court action. But I would also say this, um, and uh, I, I hope the RSPB will listen uh, to this, because protecting the environment is really important. And I know uh, they have legitimate concerns about this. So uh, I would want to say very clearly uh, to them and to others with concerns that we want to make sure we work in a way that allows the development of offshore wind for all the benefits it brings, but does so with the protection of the environment very much paramount, and I hope we can move forward on that basis. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may be aware that an estate agency based in Edinburgh, McEwen Fraser Legal, is demanding a buyer's premium fee on the sale of property. If prospective buyers don't agree to pay this, then the property is offered to the next bidder who can pay it. Concerns about this practice have been raised with me by a constituent who spent 12 years saving for his first flat and is now expected to pay a buyer's premium fee of £2,940 on a £130,000 flat. Does the First Minister agree with me that the buyer's premium fee is an example of unscrupulous, unethical, rent-seeking, sharp practice by McEwen Fraser Legal? Will her government look into this issue and assess the legality and morality of this practice, which adds further costs to the process of buying a house? And does the First Minister finally agree with me that the subject matter of the Estate Agents Act 1979 should be devolved so that this Parliament has the full powers over matters relating to the acquisition of land and property? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, I'm happy to look into this matter further. I certainly do agree with Andy Whiteman that these powers should be uh, devolved. The regulation of estate agents is currently uh, a reserved matter because it is covered by the Consumer Protection Reservation in the Scotland Act. Uh, I absolutely uh, agree that fees charged by estate agents should be completely transparent and clear. Um, I understand the Scottish Government has recently received one complaint about charging a buyer's premium. So I will make further inquiries about the point uh, and the case that has been raised by Andy Whiteman today and will write to the member on this matter once I've got further information. Lewis MacDonald. The Minister will know that NHS Grampian this week announced that it can no longer guarantee surgery within 12 weeks of diagnosis. It is not in a position to meet the targets she has set. Will our government therefore step up to the plate and provide NHS Grampian with the funding it should receive under the government's own NRAC formula, a formula which is now nearly 10 years old and has still not been delivered. First Minister. Of course, we've moved health boards uh, much closer to parity, as it's uh, called, um, than was the case when we took office and under NRAC, which of course replaced the Arbuthnot formula, uh, we continue to do that. On the specific issue raised by 
Lewis MacDonald. Uh, we are clear with all health boards that patients who are waiting for treatment, uh, such as elective surgery, must be seen as quickly as possible. Um, and it's important that patients with the highest clinical priority, such as cancer patients, for example, uh, are seen uh, extremely quickly. We are already uh, investing additional resources. We've also been working with NHS Grampian and with other health boards about uh, further investment, which we will uh, announce very soon to help boards build up their capacity, particularly their elective capacity, to make sure that all patients are treated in a timely fashion. Uh, we see waiting times in our health service now lower than they were when this government first took office, but we also see demand on our health service continue to rise, mainly due to the ageing population. So we must continue to work with health boards and make sure health boards uh, have the required resources uh, so that they can continue to deliver the standard of service that patients deserve. Gil Patterson. First Minister, my constituent Dr Kevin Parsons, who lives in Bears Den with his wife and two children, is due to be deported on June the 11th. The Glasgow University lecturer has recently been awarded £1.32 million research grant from the UK government, which employs a further three people. The Home Office has repeatedly given Dr Parsons the wrong information which has led to this personal crisis. Dr Parsons is a Canadian national. His wife qualifies for UK citizenship and one of his children was born in the UK. Would the First Minister intervene and use her influence in this case to assist allowing Dr Parsons to remain here in Scotland and continue his valuable work? First Minister. Well, <clears throat> obviously, I, I don't know all the details of the case that Gail Patterson raises, but I would be very happy uh, to look into the detail of that and see whether there is anything the Scottish Government uh, can do to appeal to the Home Office to see uh, sense if indeed uh, that is what is required. I do think the, the, the case that Gail Patterson has outlined in terms of the details he shared uh, with the Chamber today really do seem to illustrate the complete wrong-headedness of the UK Government's approach to immigration. You know, we see today, as uh, the Tories uh, publish their manifesto, uh, a recommitment to an immigration target that they know is undeliverable. But they also know that in the process of trying to deliver that target, they will do untold damage to not just the Scottish economy, but the UK economy as a whole. We also see them today uh, reportedly publishing proposals to increase the amount of money that employers have to pay if they want to employ employ skilled migrants from outside the EU. Uh, as the BME have pointed out, that includes doctors and nurses and other people uh, working in our health service. So not only will we make it harder to recruit uh, people into uh, the health service, harder perhaps to recruit people into the teaching profession from outside uh, this country, uh, but we will also charge our public services when they are trying to do so. So this really sums up uh, the fact that the UK are pursuing an immigration policy that is damaging to the economy of the country. And of course, they are trying, uh, they're doing it as they are increasingly morphing into UKIP. Uh, and that, I think, uh, makes it all the more important that after this general election, there are strong voices standing up to the Tories and making sure that Scotland's interests in this area and in so many other areas are properly protected. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. A few days ago, the Prime Minister showed how hugely in touch she is with the priorities of the country by declaring that she's always supported fox hunting and maintains a commitment to its reintroduction. Uh, today, the Conservative manifesto promises a step backwards in reintroducing this cruel and barbaric act to parts of these islands. And it was also revealed that one of Ruth Davison's former colleagues who resigned recently is a member of a fox hunting club in Scotland claiming that it was part of her way of life. An estimated 800 foxes are killed by hunts each year in Scotland, 20% of which are killed by packs of hounds rather than being shot in clear breach of the Wild Mammals Act. And the First Minister will be well aware of the huge amount of anger and concern there is amongst members of the public about this issue. So does she agree with those members of the public who are contacting all parties at the moment to demand a ban on this brutal act? 
Does she agree with her own party leader at Westminster who says he totally opposes fox hunting? And if she does, will the law in Scotland totally oppose fox hunting? First Minister. Well, firstly, before I come on to the position of the Scottish Government, I, I do think it says a lot about the priorities of Theresa May and the Tories when you know, they go out of their way to deny Parliament any say over the hugely important issues associated with Brexit, and yet they are committed to giving Parliament a free vote on reintroducing fox hunting. If ever uh, there was something that said this is a government that has got completely the wrong priorities, then I suspect this is it. Now, uh, obviously, when uh, David Cameron was talking about uh, this previously, that raised an issue about the differences between the law in England and in Scotland. At that point, we committed uh, to looking at loopholes in the Scottish law, uh, as Patrick Harvey will be aware. Uh, we've had Lord Bonamy look at this uh, in detail. We are now consulting on Lord Bonamy's recommendations and considering whether changes in the law are required as a result of that. So, yes, I do understand the concerns of the people who are writing uh, to us. I have always uh, been an opponent of, of fox hunting and uh, remain an opponent of fox hunting and we need to make sure that the operation of the law in Scotland is appropriate and that's exactly what this process is intended to ensure. Patrick Harvey. Well I think the very many people contacting politicians at the moment on this issue will want a clearer answer uh, about what is proposed in Scotland. The, the Bonamy review was welcome but it followed a very narrow remit defined by the Scottish Government, which specifically excluded consideration of a full ban. And indeed, uh, his Lordship himself uh, said that he uh, always had in notion the mind that there must be a way of preserving fox hunting uh, and said that, uh, this, that he, he was not minded to abolish fox hunting, but to find a way of maintaining it. So while some of the proposals may go beyond the status quo, they would be a tantamount to, tantamount to proposing that the Scottish Government endorses a form of regulated fox hunting. Now, if the Scottish Government means to consult openly on this issue, can the First Minister confirm that the consultation will include consideration of a complete ban on mounted fox hunting in Scotland, and failing that, removing the exemption in the Act that allows flushing of foxes to guns given the significant evidence that this activity is used as a decoy for traditional, brutal and barbaric fox hunting? First question. Firstly, I think um, while I, I do understand uh, the concerns that people are expressing and share some of those concerns, I do think Patrick Harvey uh, mischaracterises the position of, of the Scottish Government. The exemptions that are in the current law are, of course, exemptions that were uh, debated and agreed by this Parliament. I appreciate before Patrick, I think before Patrick Harvey uh, was a member of it in the first session uh, of this Parliament when there was a, a Members' Bill brought forward and these uh, issues uh, were fully debated at that time. Now, there have been concerns raised about uh, those... Uh, what I'm describing is, is loopholes and uh, whether we need to tighten uh, the law further. So we have embarked on a process. Mm. Uh, we have uh, had Lord Bonamy look at this in detail. Uh, we are now consulting on what Lord Bonamy has said. And I think given that this is a live consultation, we should allow that consultation to take its course. If Patrick Harvey wants to submit to that consultation, he may already have done so, in which case I apologise, then he can submit to that consultation and argue for us to go further than we are, and that will be uh, considered as part of that consultation. But I think we should go forward with this process, um, and uh, that's the right thing to do. But be under uh, no doubt at all, this government opposes uh, fox hunting, um, and uh, that's a position we have long taken. Uh, and the position we continue to take. Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Uh, children in Lothian waited 666 days to get important mental health treatment. For anyone, that must feel like a lifetime. For a person so young, that must feel like eternity. Why are waiting times so bad when the First Minister said it would be a priority? First Minister. Well, it is a priority, and as Willie Rennie knows, and I, I should say to start with, there are still some long waits for mental health treatment that are unacceptable. Uh, but we are making progress in bringing uh, waiting times down. We are also increasing 
uh, the investment in mental health services generally and also in child and adolescent mental health services and we've seen the number of people working in these services increase as well. This is a priority and I know it's a priority not just for this government for, but for parties across the chamber uh, and we'll continue to make sure that we bring uh, forward the investment uh, and the other actions that are required uh, to make sure that all young people who are coming forward for mental health treatment get that treatment uh, and get it in a timious way. As we've said before in this um, is, is true of many of the uh, challenges we grapple with in the health service, uh, but it is particularly true here. We have uh, vastly increased demand for mental health services, which is, uh, as I've said before, something we should uh, think is a good thing because it means the stigma is reducing, but it does mean that we have to equip the services to deal with that. So we are seeing improvement in terms of waiting times, we're seeing improvement in terms of investment and numbers working in mental health services, and we'll continue uh, to make sure we see that improvement continue. Willie Rennie. I'm afraid we've heard that all before. I mean, can I just quote what she said last year? Because when I asked the First Minister, she told me this. This is one of the most serious issues that we face as a society. But when we discussed this through the budget process, we discovered that the government was much further behind than even we had feared. And children in Lothian are not alone. In the 10th year of her government, the way in the Highlands is 623 days. In Fife, 611 days. In Ayrshire and Arran, 448. Grampian, it's a year. Now, the government published independence legislation in weeks, but it took 15 whole months to get around to a mental health strategy. These children deserve better from this government and this First Minister. Will those children still be waiting as long next year, or is she going to do something different? First Minister. Well, I think Willie Rennie is completely mischaracterising the position of the government. And, and the, the facts, well, actually, the facts speak for themselves. Uh, I recognise uh, the challenge of improving these services. That is why the CAMS workforce has increased by just under 50% uh, under this government. Spending on mental health has increased uh, by 40%. 2%. In this year alone, spending will increase to £1 billion uh, for the first time. Uh, and we continue uh, to take steps to ensure that mental health services get an increasing share of the overall uh, health budget. So the commitment uh, is there and it is evidenced in the action that we are taking. Uh, there are, as I've said, uh, although we're seeing waiting times uh, reduce generally, uh, there are some long waits uh, which we are uh, seeking to, to tackle. But to put that in, in context, there is now 82.5% uh, seen within uh, 18 weeks, which is a 3.5% uh, increase uh, from the last uh, quarter. So I don't pretend that we've not still got work to do here. That is a feature of the increasing demand that we're seeing. Uh, but the investment, the workforce and the progress uh, in reducing waiting times is also there uh, to see. Um, and obviously our uh, mental health strategy contains a range of actions that focus rightly on the prevention and early intervention uh, to meet the mental health needs of children uh, and young people and to step in promptly uh, where they develop. So, for example, a review of the role of pastoral guidance and counselling services uh, and a review into rejected child and adolescent mental health service uh, referrals. So, you know, yes, Willie Rennie is right to say this is a challenge that we need to address. What he is wrong to say is that we're not taking the action to address it because we very definitely are. A couple of more supplementaries. The first from Joan McAlpine. Joan McAlpine? No? OK, we'll take a supplementary from Anas Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, the Israeli Ambassador Mark Regev is in the Scottish Parliament. Will the First Minister or any representative of her government be meeting him? If so, can she deliver a very loud and clear message that after 50 years of Palestinian oppression, that the illegal occupation of the West Bank must end, that the illegal expansion of settlements must end, that the illegal siege on Gaza must end, and that they must allow free access of food, medicines and supplies into the Gaza Strip. And that he understands that without justice, without equality and without freedom, there can never be peace. First Minister. Well, 
Fiona Hislop will meet the Israeli ambassador later today, but during that meeting she will deliver, uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government, a very strong message uh, on justice for Palestine and for Palestinians, uh, covering the uh, very issues that Anna Sarwar raises. Uh, this Government has been uh, very clear in our support for people in Gaza, um, and the range of injustices and hardships that they suffer uh, and have suffered for many times. I myself have uh, led uh, a debate in this chamber uh, about uh, Gaza in the past. Uh, and ultimately, of course, we uh, remain committed to the two-state solution uh, in uh, Palestine. So that message will be delivered strongly by Fiona Hislop on behalf of the Scottish Government when she meets the Ambassador later today. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. Given the actions of the Labour Council Group in Aberdeen and reports of two further deals between Labour and Conservatives, does the First Minister agree that the clear message to voters is, is that if you vote Labour, you'll get Tory? First Minister. Well, in, in large parts of the country, it certainly seems to be the case. You know, this is a serious point. You know, Labour votes in Aberdeen yesterday were used to put the Tories into administration and I think that should uh, say something to everybody who might be considering voting Labour in the future that if you vote Labour you often don't get Labour you get the Tories um, and that is the reality and perhaps perhaps Kezia Dugdale will want to take the opportunity of just making it clear that the suspensions of the Aberdeen councillors yesterday won't miraculously be waved away after June the 8th. Uh, so perhaps at the first opportunity, Kezia Dugdale could tell us that because I suspect as soon as the general election is out of the way, we'll see these Labour Tory coalitions taking effect all over the country. Um, and that, I think, says everything we need to know about Labour and the Tories and the alliance between the two of them. Question number five, Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle homelessness in Glasgow and across the country. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government has ensured that homeless people in Scotland have some of the strongest housing rights anywhere in the world. Uh, our recent focus on the prevention of homelessness through initiatives such as housing <laughs> options has led to consistent falls in homelessness applications, including in the city of Glasgow. But there is more to do, particularly to address rough sleeping. We know that providing a home is not the only support that people, particularly vulnerable, pe vulnerable people, need. Uh, that's why our current uh, priorities include strengthening the development of approaches like Housing First, uh, currently piloted in Glasgow, which provides permanent accommodation alongside intensive peer support to help individuals with complex needs sustain their accommodation. Sandra White. I thank the First Minister for that reply, in particular the support which has been given to the homeless people in Glasgow with the various needs. And uh, basically I want to say to the First Minister and everyone in this Parliament, I'm sure they'll all agree that it's unacceptable that a country as rich as Scotland should have anyone dying on the streets due to homelessness. Now, further to that, does the First Minister share my concerns, very deep concerns, that homelessness will be exacerbated in Glasgow and the rest of Scotland with the move to universal credit, delays in payments, and the UK government's welfare changes will put more people at risk of being homeless, and this is absolutely unacceptable. First Minister. Uh, yes, yes, I do, but before I go into that, let me just underline how important it is to this government to continue to tackle homelessness and rough sleeping. I know that is a key priority of what I hope will be the new administration of Glasgow City Council uh, by the end of today. And we will work uh, with uh, the administration of Glasgow City Council to make sure that we do not have a position where people are sleeping rough uh, and anybody is facing the prospect of dying on the streets of our country. That is utterly unacceptable and not a situ situation uh, I am prepared uh, to see happen in our country. Um, on the wider point about benefit changes, this is an important point. I was in uh, Inverness at the end of last week uh, visiting a food bank and talking to some people who work front line with uh, benefit uh, applicants in Inverness and the reason Inverness is important is because it is a part of Scotland where universal credit has already been rolled out and the experience there should, should send uh, a shiver up and down our spines at the thought of universal credit being rolled out more widely because the experience there is of people's benefits uh, being hugely delayed, people not getting the money they are entitled to on time often not getting all of the money they are entitled to when they get it. Uh, I was hearing stories of people falling into rent arrears, falling into debt, 
all through absolutely no fault of their own. And, and the other point I would make here is, while I don't think that is acceptable for anybody uh, that needs social security support, many of the people who are finding themselves in these positions are people who are working. They are working hard to try to support their families uh, and they are being treated in this way uh, by a Conservative government uh, that is rolling out these benefit changes that are clearly not fit for purpose. So I think the rollout of universal credit should be halted until the Tories can assure everybody that they've got it right because the price of not doing that and of carrying on is to plunge many, many more people into misery and potential homelessness and that would be unforgivable. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In April, third sector organisations, including Shelter Scotland, emphasised the need once again for the Scottish Government to develop a new national homelessness strategy. Will the First Minister listen to their concerns and commit her government to developing this strategy? First Minister. Well, we will continue to work with organisations like Shelter to make sure we've not just got the right strategies in place, but we've got the right practical policies in place eh, to back up those strategies. Uh, we already have some of the strongest rights for homeless people in Scotland and we've seen uh, consistent falls in homelessness applications. Uh, but we do know we've got to keep making progress and we've got a particular uh, issue around uh, rough sleeping. Uh, but you know, I, I would repeat the point I've just made, uh, particularly to a Conservative member of this Parliament. Any strategy we have on homelessness and tackling homelessness or tackling poverty and lifting people out of poverty is going to continue to be undermined as long as we have a Conservative government at Westminster that is intent on driving more and more people into poverty yeah. by cruel and callous social security cuts. So I would throw the question back to the Tories. Uh, why don't you go and tell your bosses at London to stop penalising the poor and work with us to help them instead? Colleen McNeill. There is anecdotal evidence, at least, that rough sleeping is increasing in Scotland. Most people you talk to say now they see more people sleeping in doorways. Few things are more shocking than people dying from cold or hunger on the streets of Scotland. And I know that there are many reasons why this might be the case, some of which the First Minister has already mentioned. But in view of that First Minister, I urge you to review the current strategy on housing and rough sleeping. To review the fact that local authorities may need more resources to take this on. To review the fact that, although the figures may not bear this out, that the evidence is strong enough to review the strategy that we currently have. I know that the First Minister has already agreed to look at some of the options I raised last time, which is called uh, Housing, Housing First. I know she is committed to this, but in all seriousness, when you have deaths, as we've seen in the streets of Glasgow, is it not time to just at least have another look at the strategy that you currently have? First Minister. Well, it, it, indeed it wouldn't be, which is why we are taking uh, action to help councils deal with these issues. Now, in terms of the statistics around rough sleeping, and I, I'm going to cite these statistics with a degree of caution, because I think many of us think there will be an underreporting uh, in these statistics just because of the nature of the issue we're dealing with. But the statistics on rough sleeping uh, do not show an increase over the past three years. They show a, a steady state. But as I say, uh, I, I do not uh, underestimate uh, the fact that there may be an underreporting in these statistics. We are... Uh, already taking action to strengthen the homelessness and prevention strategy group so that we've got the right strategic direction but we're also taking practical action of course we're funding a post in Glasgow City Council's housing access uh, team for example uh, to make sure we're <coughs> improving uh, liaison between the council and housing associations and of course we're looking to see uh, the housing options approach which has been piloted in Glasgow extended and I, I think this was uh, something that the soon-to-be ex-moderator of the Church of Scotland raised with me when he came into office uh, a year ago. Uh, the housing options uh, approach is important because it does recognise that often, uh, particularly uh, for a vulnerable person, uh, sorry, the housing first approach, particularly for a vulnerable person, you have to do more than simply provide accommodation. It's the support that goes around that. So we are continuing to work with councils to make sure we are actively addressing these issues and we will continue to do so. And question six, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to the Scottish Retail Consortium report 
indicating that the shop vacancy rate rose from the period from January to April 2017. First Minister. Well, we have already taken significant steps to help the retail sector. Our uh, town centre first principle and our ten centre action plan is designed to tackle key issues such as empty shops and to improve the vibrancy of our 10 centres. Uh, we deliver a highly competitive business tax environment. We've lifted 100,000 properties in Scotland. I'll say it again for the benefit of the Tories. We have lifted 100,000 properties in Scotland out of non-domestic rates all together. And I'll add, for the benefit of the record, presiding officer, that the Conservatives voted against 100,000 businesses being taken out of business rates. We've also funded relief for two-thirds of retail properties. Uh, and of course, we've given local authorities the power to further reduce rates. Uh, it's important to note that the shop vacancy rate in Scotland is lower now than it was in 2015. It remains lower than that of the UK, but we continue uh, to want to do more to support the retail sector and get shops in our town centres uh, occupied and providing services to the public. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for her response. Shop vacancies are up, while the productivity growth in Scotland retail is slower than the rest of the UK. Yep. This is further evidence that this Scottish Government's economic policies are failing. Yep. Yep. With the business rate revolution hitting Scottish retails hard, the Government needs to get back to the day job of focusing on the economy, or it will be the Scottish retail sector who will have to pay the price. First Minister. Well, just... You know, we, we've seen uh, an increase uh, from January this year to April from 9% to 9.2% in terms of the vacancy rate. But back in 2015, the vacancy rate was at 10.6%. So it's lower now than it was then. Uh, we also see the Scottish Retail Consortium uh, report highlighting that footfall in Scotland's high streets uh, and retail parks actually grew uh, by 3.2%, the third fastest growth rate of all of the uh, UK's uh, nations and regions, and the fastest growth in Scotland since July 2014. Uh, so those are just a few facts to uh, perhaps correct some of the uh, mischaracterisations uh, at the heart of uh, the question. But, you know, uh, the member cites the wider economic performance in Scotland and, you know, we, uh, like other parts of the UK, uh, have got work to do to get our economy growing faster, something that's not going to be helped uh, by the extreme Brexit that the Tories are pursuing. But, you know, yesterday we saw unemployment again fall below the UK average. We saw employment in Scotland increase. We saw productivity growth in Scotland around 7% over the last few years, completely stagnant in the rest of the UK. Uh, so we'll get on with the hard work of supporting our economy. Uh, and unfortunately, we face a Tory government at Westminster that appears intent through its extreme Brexit in undermining our economy. That is the reality. Thank you. That concludes the First Minister's questions. We now move on to members' business in the name of Colin Smith on sneering. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.